Hi. Um, so we're going to talk about Karen Horney here, and I need to tell you that Karen Horney is one of my uh, favorite theorists um, and has been since I was a student, probably taking theories of personality just like you. Um, and so uh, so I'm just, you know, just kind of telling you that before we start. But the reason she's one of my favorites is she feels most directly applicable to how I think about human beings, especially when I think about human beings who are having trouble um, in their lives. And so as a clinician, um, I don't refer directly to Horney in my clinical work, but I feel like her theories in some ways inform my work more directly than some of the other theories. Um, but even when I encounter people outside of clinical work, um, I think it's a really useful theory um, to think about. So we'll see if you feel the same way. Um, so again, we'll start with some biographical information. And I do this each time because I think that, um, you know, these theorists, of course, are um, pioneers, all of them. And in doing that, I think that their own experiences in life, especially their early experiences, really inform how they um, see the world and therefore how they see people. Um, so Horney uh, was born in 1885. Um, and uh, the, the significant things about her early life is this very, first of all, her parents are uh, have very discrepant in age. Um, her mother is much, much younger than her father. And her father is this very strict, scary figure. Uh, Karen hold, held him in awe, but um, you know, but he also really didn't believe she should uh, pursue medical school, that she should pursue a career, um, and was very, very strict with the kids. Um, her mother was very different, was dynamic and beautiful by Karen Horney's description, and protective of her children. Um, and she had some difficult experiences in, in growing up that she uh, reports of her own that she always felt unattractive, unloved, unwanted. Um, was very connected to her brother who dies in her early adulthood. Um, and, um, and so she has these hard experiences and especially seems to have uh, wanted her father's approval um, in a way that simply wasn't available to her. Um, and so she does get married uh, when she's quite young um, and uh, marries a man very much like her father. Um, and uh, and she has three daughters in six years, uh, so you know gets very productive in terms of having children. Hang on a second, I'm just going to move this. Um, all right. Um, and uh, right after her brother dies, soon after her brother dies, uh, Karen uh, Horney really reinvents her life. She leaves her husband, uh, and she becomes very involved in what at the time would have been uh, left-wing groups. Um, so this is be in the Warren 20s, uh, right? Um, and so she uh, engages in things that uh, like trial marriage, which would have been living together, which now, of course, is not a big deal, but at the time would have been a very big deal. Um, and, and free love, meaning having sex with um, people you're not necessarily in a relationship with, um, and nudism. So all of these would have been really radical ideas in the 1920s. Um, and she become, gets disqualified as a psychoanalyst um, in New York um, because of that, or at least as a training analyst, um, because of these ideas. Um, and she struggles her whole life with depression and uh, feeling inadequate. Um, and if we compare her to Freud, we see some of the same differences and, uh, and very different um, ideas than, uh, as, and similarly to how we talk with other theorists. So um, she does not uh, focus on sexuality, um, and that's been a common theme for us in, in post-Freudian theorists. Um, she uh, has much more feminist views, and so rejects penis envy um, and the idea of an ethical conflict that is a necessary part of growing up. Um, and she sees the superego as what she called an erotic structure. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about her ideas about the of being neurotic. Um, and essentially neurotic is about kind of desperate, rigid coping um, that makes behaviors not necessarily productive um, and responsive to history more than responsive to the current situation. But we'll talk more about that. Um, and so she does use this word neuroticism a lot. Um, she uses it very differently than how we used it in the big fives, and it's not about emotional expression uh, or emotional reactivity. Um, this is about having rigid, um, not productive, non-constructive uh, reactions or ways of responding to the world. And essentially, the basic idea here is that early in our lives, we develop ways of coping with difficult circumstances. Um, and that uh, maybe we all do this. If the circumstances are difficult enough, we certainly do it. 
Um, but for horn eye, the problem isn't the original coping mechanism. It's um, that if things were overwhelming enough, you develop um, kind of a rigid go-to style of coping with difficulty. Um, that most of us, if we're moving through our lives and encounter difficulty, we kind of look at a menu, right? And say, how you know, what is my best way of coping with this difficulty? I have a difficult friend. I'm in a difficult relationship. Um, I have a difficult child. Um, I've run into obstacles at school or at work, um, but what is my, you know, what is the thing that's going to help best with this very specific situation? But according to Horney, if we have had overwhelming difficulty um, in our childhoods, we sometimes develop, and even if they're not overwhelming, I suppose, we sometimes in childhood develop a single approach to coping with difficulty. And then we just apply that. We don't look at a menu. We just apply that kind of indiscriminately, no matter what situation you wind up in. Um, and that winds up, rather than being responsive to the situation, we just kind of bring our go-to method. And sometimes it's not going to be helpful in that situation. Um, and the other thing is that the use of that method gets to be something on a hair trigger. In, in other words, um, we don't carefully think about whether we need to respond to a situation by protecting ourselves. We just protect ourselves. Um, all the time. Um, and so we'll talk about this in more detail. Um, so for Horney, there are these basic struggles in childhood um, that she says we all have. Uh, that there's basic anxiety, which is something all children experience. Uh, the children are small and powerless, and they um, often feel hopeless and lonely. Um, and that the world can sometimes feel hostile to them. And the degree of basic anxiety is going to depend on the household, right? The family dynamics. Because in some family dynamics, hopefully in lots of families, um, there are very uh, infrequent feelings of hostility. Um, and then in other families, that will be uh, a more common experience. Um, and then the child develops basic hostility as the result of basic anxiety um, that the child's angry, that they're being made to feel anxious, um, and that uh, children don't feel that they can often express that hostility. In fact, the reality is if children express hostility, they often are disciplined. Um, and so they repress that, and it increases a sense of anxiety and lack of control and feelings of defensive this defenselessness. And so that feeling of anxiety is both common in childhood but then can become problematic and lead to neurotic behavior um, in, the, in our personality if that's a more common rather than less common, if the experiences in the family go beyond typical levels. Um, right, and so uh, the level of difficulty in childhood and the level of repression. So in some families, children can say, I'm angry, right? Um, they can say, I need to talk to you about something. I don't like the way I'm being treated, and that's okay. And in other families, that would be um, completely not uh, okay. So I, I remember, I always think of a story here of uh, Jess when she was in middle school, um, had a friend who came from a very, very um, strict family. And um, and she was not allowed to have sleepovers, and she was so Jesse was having a birthday party with a you know the sleepover with a bunch of friends, and this one friend wasn't allowed to come, and Jess just kept saying to her friend um, the thing that would have worked in our family, which is to say, which is to say, um, you know, why don't you talk to your parents, let them know that you're upset with them, that they won't let you do this, and and Jess was advocating um, for you know expression of um, of anger that the rules were too strict um, and her friend just kind of wide-eyed kept saying to her I'm not allowed to do that in my family right so there's a range that doesn't necessarily mean that that friend had overwhelming feelings of being alone and helpless in a hostile world um, but it's more likely if she can't express herself right um, and so Horney says that uh, we have several neurotic trends for to be specific um, that we can talk about. And those neurotic trends are the neurotic need for affection, the neurotic attitude of compliance and submissiveness, neurotic need for power, and neurotic withdrawal. Now remember, neurotic means that you're using this as a go-to method of self-protection without any analysis of the specific situation. So, for example, the neurotic need for affection, the person uh, concludes that if you love me, you will not hurt me, right? And so if I need to keep myself safe, then I'm just going to make sure I make myself lovable, um, that I'm going to uh, make myself lovable, I'm going to check in and make sure that I'm loved, um, and if that's the case, you won't hurt me. Uh, but it also means that you may seek out affection from somebody who is not a likely good source of affection. 
It might mean that you seek out affection um, and do that above and beyond your own needs in other ways, right? Um, that you make yourself lovable by, um, you know, by giving up other things um, that you might want so that the person will like you better or pretending to be something you're not so the person will love you more, right? Uh, so you can see the rigidity there and the, the lack of looking at the big picture or the specific situation, um, right? So that's an example. And we'll look at, um, right, so... So we'll look at each of these um, in a little bit more detail. Um, so the neurotic need for affection, um, as we were just talking about, right? And the result is emotional dependence on other people, um, responding um, lovingly to anyone who shows kindness of any kind. Um, and so I've seen, you know, I've had people um, in, so I can think of some clients I've had, uh, for example, who when they're dating, um, it's, oh, it's just enough that the other person is interested in them, that they're not showing any, um, critical analysis of whether they're attracted to this person or whether they're, um, you know, feeling affection for this person. But as long as the other person likes them, then that's enough reason to be in a relationship with them. Um, so the neurotic attitude of compliance and submissiveness is pretty descriptive. Um, essentially, you're, you're not paying any attention to your own needs and you're just focusing on what other people want. Um, you're willing to let yourself be abused without defense or willing to just go along with whatever the other person. And again, think about this in terms of uh, an attempt to keep yourself safe. If you feel basically unsafe in the world, um, that you basically say, if I give in, um, I won't be hurt, right? Um, and the neurotic need for power is really the opposite of this. This is if I'm in charge, if I'm in control, I cannot be hurt. Um, and that this is, right, so there's not a feeling of, per there's not someone who actually feels powerful, somebody who's always seeking to be in control or powerful um, so that they'll feel safe. Um, and so uh, it's a very brittle and, and it's, there's, there's never, right, again, it's not about in this situation would it help me to be powerful. It's I always need to feel powerful. And it's basically the opposite of feeling helpless. And then the neurotic withdrawal is if I withdraw, you cannot hurt me. Um, and so here, uh, the, the person restricts their needs to a minimum. They don't ask for anything from other people. They're emotionally detached from other people. That as long as they're independent, they feel safe. And that is the basic idea. Um, so here's a, a book. I have to say, this is, um, as an undergraduate and even as a graduate student, one of my uh, favorite books. Because Hornei writes in the 20th century, uh, her, re her writing is a little bit more accessible feeling than some of the other theorists we've talked about. And I think this book feels very accessible. Um, and I think you can get it on Amazon for like, I don't know, a new copy, I think it's $14. I'm sure you can get a used copies other places. I, um, so in case you're interested in reading more about this. Okay, but again, I think that lots of people I see, especially in my clinical practice, often have ways of coping, what Horn and I would have called neurotic styles, that are rigid, kind of rigidly linked to coping mechanisms that worked when they were at some other point in life, and now they're just using them indiscriminately. So we'll, talk, we'll have a chance to talk more about this.